And uh, does everyone know the story of Shantideva? No? Shantideva has a great story. Shantideva was a uh, great uh, writer and yogi and philosopher in India in the 7th century, maybe 8th, 7th, 8th century. And he, when he was at the uh, Nalanda University, he, he was not considered a very good student. In fact, he was called Busuku. Busuku. And Busuku means one who eats, sleeps, and defecates. <laughs> because uh, he, he fell asleep in class. He was like, you know, they thought he was just totally out of it. They couldn't understand why he was there. <laughs> you know, I'm telling the story of Shantideva a little bit. Butsuko. Butsuko. And uh, so then uh, finally the teachers were getting sick of him. So they said, well, you know, Shantideva, we have a certain level of, uh, of tolerance of students here. And then it gets to be time, up and out kind of time. You've got to do their thesis. And, and the way they did their thesis was they had to give an address to the entire uh, community, you know, the whole university. They give a mass address. And so it's time for you to do your presentation. You've been here like 10 years, or whatever it was. And uh, he said, OK. And then they were all laughing. They were thinking, oh, this is really funny. He's going to give a talk. Shan is going to give a talk. So then he said, then he said to them, he said, would you like? Uh, so then they all were going to congregate. Shantideva is going to give a talk. It's like, a, you know, he gives his thesis. It's going to be like a big joke. And so then he came, and he came on the throne there, the teaching platform. And then he said to them, do you want something Press that you've heard before or something that you haven't ever heard before? He said to them, which would you like? Something precedented or unprecedented? And they said, from you, Busuku, unprecedented for sure. <laughs> so then he said, and he just recited these verses. What is it, 800 verses, I think. What, what is it? Oh, he counts them. I think it's about seven, 800 verses. And it's, in Sanskrit, it's the mo among the most beautiful poetry in the language, in the Buddhist version of the language. He was a great, great writer. And the meaning is so profound. And it's really, very really amazing. But then toward the end, there are two different endings to the book. From the, from the ninth chapter on, uh, apparently, the, when he said this phrase, without being aware of the, of the thing that you are imagining, to be the falsely, in other words, to be the reality of things, you cannot understand the unreality of that. Or in other words, it's true nature, it's, it's freedom, it's emptiness, it's, it's uh, voidness. So you have to first see how you, mis how you misunderstand it, in other words, which is a very true thing. When you meditate on selflessness, you never meditate on selflessness. You meditate on the quest to find the self. And, and you look at how you perceive yourself. And then when you can't find what you habitually assume you are being when you are being yourself, that failure to find it is the discovery of selflessness type of thing. If you think you just meditate on selflessness, you will become a nihilist. You'll think about some void or some, some space, some dark absence or something like that. Probably fall asleep. So, so, it's, so, th so that's the kind of practical procedure. But at the time he came to that verse in the ninth chapter, he started levitating <coughs> off the chair. And he started floating away like this, going to the southeast. <laughs> and the people by that time were so enchanted by his amazing recitation that they were following him, writing it down. You know, And apparently different teams like, got different distances. So there are different versions. And then he apparently he said the, the, the precedented version in other words, where he's quoting a lot of sutras, something called the Sutra Samucha. He said, you'll find that under my bed in my room. And then he left. He, completed, he left the university. He became a, what they call a siddha, an adept. And he, lived in, he went to work uh, in, a, in Orissa, Orissa, in a South Indian kingdom, they say. But anyway, that's, so that's his kind of funny story, Shantideva's story. 
And um, the thing is, that what I want to introduce, and then we'll then we will go into the the begin the, the main meat of it. Uh, remember, I said there were two ways of generating the spirit of enlightenment. Two spe meaning the love and compassion, universal love and compassion for all beings. And in the Tibetan tradition, collected from the Indian tradition. And the one of them is the one we briefly looked at about meditating on all beings as having been your mother from the beginning lessons of the universe. And the other one is this one, which is the exchange of self and other, which is verses 90 and following in this book. Expressed, that's the, like the locus classicus of it. And, uh, but it connects to ver chapter 6, which is why what I thought I had sent you. I'm sorry. Somehow it didn't it's reach. coming. But uh, the chapter 6, because chapter 6 is the patience chapter. And patience is the stepping stone to compassion. In the sense that you have to stop hating your enemy first, or hating others, or being irritated with them, or finding them like a complete pain. First, you have to become patient with them, even if they are even harmful or troublesome. And then you can slowly learn to have compassion and love for them. So, you know, the Buddhist tradition is always very practical. First, get over being annoyed by all beings, and then, and then to, and to figure out some way where you're invulnerable to harm from them and invulnerable to reacting to harm with anger. And then from that, you can learn to where you can see them as potentially happy and, and through, as love, through loving eyes, and through, as deserving of freedom from suffering through compassionate eyes. So those, the precept is, goes like in that path. That's, that's why we begin reading about the anger, first of all. Hate, anger, you know, anger, hate. OK? So that's the, that's the introduction. And then you wanted to do something on the three poisons. Please do. Well, I mean, it's just, no. it just follows up yeah. on that point. Exactly. Um, you know, the, I don't know if you guys, you pass it probably all on the way into the room, but the, the uh, wheel of life um, depiction that's outside of every Buddhist temple, usually, mm -hmm. and it illustrates the basic Buddhist worldview. And I use it for the tours that I give here to school groups and things like that because it neatly encapsulates, even for the illiterate, I think that was the original purpose of it, um, the sort of metaphysic of the Buddhist worldview. So it has the different realms of existence and the, and the cycle of, of you know, being born, dying, and reborn, and so forth, cycles of rebirth, and the, and the different um, realms of incarnation. And at the center of it, you have the three poisons. And so given that, from the Buddhist point of view, sentient beings are characterized by wanting pleasure and not wanting pain, the question then becomes, and he addresses this in here, the question then becomes, well, why don't we get the one and avoid the other? And the answer is that we have a tendency that's very much conditioned by these three poisons, which are not original sins, but are just tendencies. Um, the three poisons of ignor ignorance, uh, anger, and, and uh, greed, or lust, depending on the type of preacher that's talking about them. The greedy ones talk about lust, and the lustful ones talk about greed, as far as I can figure out. But in any case, the... Uh, the, uh, so that ignorance is the basic main problem in the sense of you know, the delusional misapprehension of reality. And then you make judgments based on this delusional misapprehension of reality. You don't get the results you want. You don't get, and you get many of the consequences you don't, the unintended consequences you don't want. And, um, and, and then I tend, to, I tend to see anger and uh, greed or lust as sort of negatives and positive of this basic dysfunctional relationship with, between self and other and self and reality in the sense that um, anger is the, is the negative dysfunctional relationship and then uh, greed is the positive dysfunctional right. relationship. And in both cases, you're kind of mistaking means for ends. Mm -hmm. So in the case of anger, you, you have a, a misperception of the way in which you see a certain situation, you're trying genuinely to accomplish something for, I think, a reasonably good motive, but it's not working out. It's not, it's not uh, coming to fruition. You're being blocked, and it's, it's, uh, it builds up frustration. You're not being able to achieve your goal. And as a consequence, this frustration become, builds up and builds up and builds up and becomes intolerable unless you have some mechanism to step back and reinvestigate the situation that you're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. There's this tendency to want to release that pressure by reifying and completely blaming the other, be it a person or an inanimate object, whereupon the logic that, well, completely and obliterating and destroying the other becomes very attractive as a way of releasing that frustration. 
So it's like this idea that the relation is not working out, not because you're misperceiving the basic nature of the relationship, but because the other is entirely intransigent and hopeless and and um, in your way, and, and in your way, and so then it, you know, anger leads to violence, and so on and so forth. But it's essentially like a, a reifying of uh, a diluted way of seeing the situation. Whereas greed is the reverse, where the aim is a positive, healthy relationship, where you're appreciating the good qualities and the happiness of the, the is brought, you know, by your connection to the other. But you're but you're dealing with the surface, you're reifying the person rather than, rather than working on the relationship and so you know, negative consequences also ensue. Mm -hmm. So I just, that's just where I wanted, just thought it was interesting that it's like it mm -hmm. goes right, it's right there in the basics. Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and basically also just to point out that the, um, as I see it, and what's interesting in Shantideva's thing is like the, from the very first stanza he talks about how a single flash of anger ruins eons of work that you've done. Mm -hmm in unraveling mm -hmm. these habitual patterns and the ways that you see the world. And I was always, you know, I'm always wondering about that. Well, it, yes, it is terrible to become angry and these sorts of things. In what sense does it unravel it? And I was thinking mm -hmm. that perhaps, you know, the, the, fact of, the fact of anger intensifying one's delusion, you know, looking at it from the point of view of anger being a subset in a sense, a, an outgrowth of ignorance or delusion, that, it, that by acting on an ignorant perspective, a delusional point of view, you're making it that much worse. You're trapping mm -hmm. yourself that much more deeply in it. Mm -hmm. So that's all I wanted to mention, mm -hmm. was okay. just to go from the... Uh, yeah, then, you know. then uh, that's, that works very well. The, often people translate the, the kama raga as just split, simply desire, and then people think, well, if I don't want anything, then I'll be enlightened. But lust is better translation for it. Greed and lust are more in the line where the other being is like an object that you want to, you want to swallow. You know, the basic delusion is that it's you versus the universe, and other beings are just objects for you, either to get them out of your way and prevent them from swallowing you, or swallowing them. You know? Right. So that's, that's basically like that. So, right. Anyway, so Shantideva begins with this. And what I like about this chapter is, um, there is no evil like hatred. Hatred is also like hatred, anger. Anger, some people like anger because they think that anger gives you energy to correct wrong things, you know. And um, they, mis they, 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 they define the word anger as just meaning kind of a forceful response to something negative and a forceful feeling about it, like heated, using strong, hot energy. And in a way, as long as what the Buddhists mean by anger and what the what English speaking and writing moralists, you know, like Chaucer, from Chaucer onward, when they use anger, they mean rage, uncontrollable rage, you know. They mean when all it is is a wish to destroy some object. They don't just mean a strong uh, negative conviction or, or, you know, assertive conviction about something. So in, the, in our modern parlance, some people think that if you define anger as any kind of negative reaction to something, then maybe that's defining it too broadly. Because it, it doesn't, that you'd be free of anger doesn't mean that you wouldn't react critically or even assertively to prevent some negative thing. Uh, you know what I mean? You could be outraged in a way. When we use the word outraged at Injustice. Obama's Okay. betraying his campaign promises or something. But you wouldn't be in furious, you know, you wouldn't be furious, blind, you know, where you would have lost control of your, you know, judgment and, you know, your whatever the plan would be to prevent this negative thing from, uh, from happening, you know. So that's a very key point. Well, and, yeah, I think it's important to remember that there is a, an initial motive in the core of it that is, an, a, yes. is essentially a, a perfectly innocent desire to accomplish something yeah. somewhere or another. That, that part is okay. Like, what is anger when it's, when it's transformed? I know it's not within this sort of text, but like, anger when it's transformed. It's transformed into ultimate reality, perfection, wisdom. Okay. <laughs> in so the sense that it, uh, ultimate reality, perfection, wisdom means a kind of experience of the nature of ultimate reality, which is freedom or emptiness or selflessness. 
And that experience is where, in a way, you see through in a medit with, a, with the meditative eye, with the Dharma eye, with the Samadhi eye, you see through existence, including yourself, in the mm -hmm. process. So everything seems to disappear. And it has the, it, it's the transmutation of anger because it's connected to intelligence and analysis. Mm -hmm. It takes everything apart. And it, you know, even down to the subatomic particle, and it perceives that there is no thing that is independently established separate from other things. Mm -hmm. No intrinsically real thing. And so that then liberates you into realizing what at first, when you first achieve that, you have an experience of like melting into infinite space, but then the infinite space melts back into the divided things. Mm -hmm. Or in other words, it doesn't get in the way of the, of the differentiated things, but then you perceive the differentiated things from all directions, so to speak. You don't perceive them from being locked into a subjective pers uh, you know, position apart from everything else, or everything and everyone else, if you follow me. Do you follow me? Follow that? In other words, if you once see through something and you realize that it has, there's no piece of it that is absolutely what it seems to be, and then yet it appears like a, like a vision, then you, or so, or like, you know, if you never had seen a mirror, as they claim, some anthropologists claim in some tribes or something, they go and they show them a mirror, and they try to reach into the mirror, the, the quote unquote, the famous natives, Although I'm skeptical because everybody has a body of water they can see a reflection in, you know. But anyway, they, there are claims like that. And so, but then once you see that it's a mirror image, you don't try to reach in there. You realize it's just a, it's just a reflection on a surface. And you know, what is, what the, the thing itself is some other thing, you know, you, you realize that. So similarly, when you realize selflessness, you, you realize that everything is reflected in the surface of freedom, and nothing is as it seems to be a separate thing in itself. And all things therefore only exist in relationship to other things, including yourself. You only exist in relationship to other things. And, uh, and that's apparently, uh, that's enlightenment. <laughs> they say. Well, it's also his method for, what? it's also his method for maintaining patience. I mean, he goes through a lot. Yeah, that's one discussion. of the methods, one, one of the, the three methods. types of patience. Right. So, so coming to anger, so, so that's saying now the other thing I, I just wanted to say, and I'm not just putting in a plug, it's an old book and it doesn't matter, but Shantideva, of course, this guide to the Bodhisattva's way of life, is, it begins by him, him doing, uh, talking about the benefits of, in this translation, he calls it the awakening mind, I call it the spirit of enlightenment. Spirit of awakening, you could say. Some people don't like the word enlightenment. They think it's like the European enlightenment. It's like everything's going to be a machine, you know, some materialism. They think that's what enlightenment has to be. But, um, it, which it, that's not true, but they don't, so they don't like that word. So they say awakening. But awakening is, but well, never mind. I don't want to get into that. So, so the point is, he starts with that about how, you know, the, the way to live is to adopt an evolutionary purpose for your life. You know, the purpose-driven life, Rick Warren's famous uh, book, Born Again book, fundamentalist book, is kind of fun, that one. Uh, you know, of course, he's connecting it to Jesus. But, uh, but and, the, and Buddhism is sort of, again, a middle way. You know, uh, I just did a PhD thesis this morning of some guy. Good thesis. He passed, Joe McClellan. That's good to hear. And, uh, one of my uh, PhD students, my, the other colleagues passed him. And his, one of his big things was trying to root out teleology, noticing how modern secular thinkers and materialists and scientists, they're very against the idea of teleology, meaning that there's an outside providence or God or some omnipotent thing that is placing a purpose in life. So the universe has a purpose, in other words. That's what teleology means. They're really against that idea. And um, religious people, of course, they believe in God or the different kinds of things. And, and they, theistically religious people, they think that, yeah, the, the purpose is God's purpose. And it's, you know, to make all beings happy and make them like him and bring them to heaven, etc. At least human beings in, in the Western traditions and Hindu traditions, all beings. And uh, Buddhism is sort of in between. 
in the sense that the samsaric life, the life of just following your impulses of greed, hate, and delusion, has no purpose. And it, you just go from birth to death, and then you get to death, and you've eaten, and you've eaten, slept, and defecated. <laughs> maybe produced offspring, maybe built something or had your name known by people and harmed some people, helped some people. And then you die the same way you were and you might be human again, you might not. And, but that has kind of, there's been no purpose to it. But the Buddhist view is if you get the idea that your sort of innate quest for happiness, which we all admit that we, we all do have that purpose. Everybody has the immediate purpose of wanting not to be, feel pain, not to be hurt, and to be happy. We all want that. That's, that's so, so commonplace, people think it's not even interesting. They, they'll call it hedonism or something. You just want pleasure. But, but in fact, that's our natural purpose. So um, the point is, if they get the idea, when you get the idea that there's a way of being really happy for ever, based on your consciousness as a human, and going along, especially in Mahayana, with the, with, the, with the ability to help others who you like become really happy permanently, without meaning that that's a, by obliterating them, that everybody has to be obliterated to be happy, really happy, then you can choose that purpose. So then you're giving yourself, by your own choice, a teleology. Mm -hmm. You're saying, my purpose in all my lives is to become the being of total awareness of the reality of bliss that Buddha told me is the nature of reality, and sharing that with other people. Oh, oh thanks, Katashi, that's so nice. And sharing that with other people. Everybody and uh, people may already have a version of the book. This is a particular version from my sense of Buddha, my own translation. And, uh, so that's what is called the awakening mind, the spirit of enlightenment. And, uh, you know, it's like one who has seized the mind of enlightenment with the thought never to turn away from totally liberating the infinite forms of life. From that time hence, even while asleep or unconcerned, a force of merit equal to the sky will perpetually ensue. So in other words, it's like, it's the Buddhist version of being born again. When somebody chooses that purpose themselves, are quite aware that there's no outside power forcing them to do so. It's up to them to make that choice. And then really is con you know, makes that consolidated and really you know, enters the path of doing so. Then automatically everything works well for that being. And uh, if even the thought, he says, if even the thought to relieve living creatures of merely a headache is a beneficial intention endowed with infinite goodness. And in the Buddhist view of evolution, if you have the slightest good thought, tiniest good thought about somebody, oh, I wish so and so didn't hurt, or oh, I wish they didn't have such an unhappy feeling, oh, it's too bad, so and so. If you just have a little thought like that to the, to the, to the interrelated, interconnected worldview bearing Buddhas, that little thought is like the match that can create a forest fire, the drop that makes an ocean, enough of them, you know, gradually over, because the time is infinite. The time span of every, every continuum is infinite. There's no limit to anything. So a tiniest good thought is, the, is Buddhahood. It's the, it's the path to Buddhahood, in other words. And therefore, he says, if it's endowed with, you know, if such a, such a wish just to, to relieve a headache, you know, like, I wish I could hear, have an aspirin, I want you not to feel that headache. That's a beneficial intention endowed with infinite goodness. It's infinite, not because that headache was infinite to that person, but because it's moving in the direction of infinite goodness. Then what need is there to mention the wish to dispel their inconceivable misery, wishing ev all beings, that is, wishing every single one of them to realize boundless good qualities? Do f even fathers and mothers have such a benevolent intention as this? Do the gods and sages, does even Brahma have it? And Brahma is the, is the most powerful of the deities in this era in India. And so, he, so, and so the Hindus at this time think he's the creator. And Buddhists don't think that, but they do think he exists. But they're saying he doesn't even have that intention because he doesn't think it's possible. 
Why a mother would have that intention? Oh, when she looks at the little Google, oh, I want you to be a Buddha. <laughs> Mom would definitely want that. But if she doesn't have an idea of what is a Buddha, or that it's possible for a human being to become a Buddha, she's not going to have that. She's going to say, well, I want you to be president of the United States. I want you to be the next Beethoven. I want you to be the next Lady Gaga. I want you to be whatever. You know? <laughs> Thinking that those are really good things to be. You know? Little, <laughs> you know, so therefore, that's the reason. It isn't anything shortchanging mom's great attitude. It just means they wouldn't have that idea. So he says, how can I fathom the depths of the goodness of this jewel of the mind, the panacea that relieves the world of pain and is the source of all its joy? If merely a benevolent intention excels venerating the Buddhas, and here's kind of a critique of normal idea of religion, then what need to, you know, just being devoted to some other being, then what need to mention striving to make all beings without exception happy? And so on. And he goes on like that. And he, he just he flips out about it. I think it's, it's funny that in the patients he goes even further and he talks about enemies actually oh, in their oh, actions. Oh, oh, oh enemies. Their actions, there are no enemies. Oh, well, no, no, exactly. The, the, the whole the sections in like one, uh, yeah. 111, th yeah, 111 yeah. through 116 yeah, there. Uh, Thanks to those whose minds are full of malice, I engender patience in myself. They therefore are the causes of my patience fit for veneration like the Dharma. There you go. So it even goes, you know, it, it culminates ultimately even in the enemies who theoretically don't even have that in no. intention from the, like, the further developed point of view as still being given credit mm -hmm. for providing that result. Uh, and right. it goes, you know, and so the mighty sage has spoken of the field of beings as well as of the field of conquerors, many who brought happiness to beings that passed beyond attaining to perfection. Thus the state of Buddhahood depends on beings and Buddhas equally. What kind of practice is it then that honors only Buddhas but not beings? You know, right, even, so. even talking about the enemy, not in the qualities of their minds but in the fruits they give, are they alike? In beings too such excellence resides and therefore beings and Buddhas are the same. Yeah. Beings are more important than Buddhas. You can't do anything for Buddhas. They don't need anything. But for beings, what you do for them, then they become Buddhas, you become Buddhas. That's more important. Is, you know, he, he says, that's right, exactly. So, so that's one thing. Then, then he goes on. Then he gives this amazing chapter 3. And my friend Father Mark is here. And this is such a, an amazing thing, you know, where he says, Thus, by the virtue collected through all that I have done, may the pain of every living creature be completely cleared away. May I be the doctor and the medicine, and may I be the nurse for all sick beings in the world until everyone is healed. May a rain of food and drink descend to clear away the pain of thirst and hunger. And during the aeon of famine, may I myself change into food and drink. So let me be the thing, the thing that feeds beings. May I become an inexhaustible treasure for those who are poor and destitute. May I turn into all things they could need, and may these be placed close beside them. Like if they need a pill, or a medicine, or a dish, or a table, or a lamp, I want to be that, even an inanimate object. You know, this is the Bodhisattva vow. You know? Without any sense of loss, I shall give up my body and my property, or enjoyments, he says, as well as all my virtues of the three times for the sake of benefiting all. By giving up all, sorrow is transcended, and my mind will realize the sorrowless state. It is best that I now give everything to all beings in the same way as I shall have to at death. Having given this body up for the pleasure of all living beings, by killing, abusing, and beating it, may they always do as they please. This is really heavy. Although they may play with my body and make it a source of jest and blame, because I have given it up to them, what is the use of holding it dear? There should, therefore, I shall let them do anything to it that does not cause them any harm. And when anyone encounters me, may it never be meaningless for him. If in those who encounter me a faithful or an angry thought arises, may that eternally become the source for fulfilling all their wishes. So even if somebody gets mad at me, may that be a source of benefit to them. May all who say bad things to me or cause me any other harm, and those who mock and insult me have the fortune to fully awaken. May I be a protector for those without one, a guide for all travelers on the way, 
May I be a bridge, a boat, and a ship for all who wish to cross the water. May I be an island for those who seek one, and a lamp for those desiring light. May I be a bed for all who wish to rest, and a slave for all who want a slave. May I be a wishing jewel, a magic vase, powerful mantras, and a great medicine. May I become a wish-fulfilling tree and a cow of plenty for the world. Just like space and the great elements such as Earth, may I always support the life of all the boundless creatures. And until they pass away from pain, may I also be the source of life for all the realms of varied beings that reach unto the ends of space. And that actual verse is one of the Dalai Lama's favorite ones. He always recites that verse, verse 22. So, so then he goes on. Then, then he rejoices that he has this crazy idea. <laughs> That he wants to be everything for every being he wants to become, which is, still, of course, a Buddha. That's how a Buddha is defined, you know, which is even hard, unimaginable in a way, inconceivable, as we have discussed before. And the reason I only mention this before we go to work on the patience and the compassion part is that we have to realize Shanti Deva's this worldview, you know, and then we have to go back to the idea that this makes sense when you feel fully connected to the universe. Being the experience of feeling fully connected to the universe is it doesn't necessarily mean sort of the high wisdom thing of where it sort of it all disappears. It just sort of the logical thing stemming from realistic worldview where you have realized that everything is cause and effect, you know, that you're in this nexus of causal energies that you're completely part of. And then even by inference, you suddenly realize there's no kind of escape. And that's frightening, actually. The religions, like, for example, if you look in the history of European thought, the, the, the Christianity, Judaism, Islam, you had this sort of God-given soul, this little spark that was like a, right, made in the image of God, right, human being, at least the men. <laughs> <laughs> That's me, no, never mind, human being. And then uh, that, that that was sort of taken out, and, and God himself was, is out of the universe. He's not affected by it. He's not connected to it. You know, he creates, but he's beyond it, so he's not really connected to it. It doesn't affect him. He's so amazing type of idea. And then you have that element in you, which when you die, if you oriented yourself toward that God, that gets disconnected from everything. And so even a sinner can be saved, etc. You know, this that whole complex. Then the secularists in, in the Western Enlightenment and Renaissance and Enlightenment, they rebelled against that because of the threatening element of it, of feeling that you could all kind of terrible things could happen to you if you were oriented the wrong way, hell and so on. And they didn't think that you could become animal like the Buddhas, because they thought animals were just material object. But uh, they, they thought they were therefore, they have a pride that they are totally connected to everything. But, but yet they nurse, they nurse in their mind the idea that when I die I'll be nothing. So they nurse the fact that the I, the ultimate referent of the I, is this little seed of nothing. And so when they die they're going to be nothing. So there will be a disconnection. Do you follow me? So all I have to do is get through it, call Jack Kevorkian, take out a painkiller and make it quick and sweet. And then luckily I'm just nothing and there's nothing more to worry about. And so that's lack of a perception of complete connection. Permanent, infinite, and specific. Or every time it will be specific and different and you don't know what it's going to be. Although. Then you get into the idea that, well, positive, opening, gentle, loving, wise action creates a wise, gentle, loving, happy connection. And harmful things create a harmful connection. So then we want to avoid all the harmful things. And then even when you really feel connected, then even the tiniest negative harmful thing can have a huge effect. And the tiniest good thing can have a huge effect. So then you become super mindful. Mindfulness really finally is, comes down to this, you know, that the way mindfulness is taught here is pretty much like, well, you just watch your mind functioning. But 
and there are some arguments between the Buddhists and some of the secular mindfulness people about this, but the real way of doing it in the Buddhist tradition is the mindfulness is corrective. It isn't just passively watching. It watches, and when it sees negative thing go in the mind, then it tries to stop that negative thing or transform it into a positive thing. It isn't just accepting everything non-judgmentally. In a way, the non-judgmental thing is useful the way it's taught at first to get people to look at what comes up in their mind because people are too much afraid to see what's there. So the idea that you can watch it non-judgmentally and just sort of see whatever pops up. Well, I mean, isn't that the beginning of the patience? Yeah, that's I mean, the, beginning, the beginning. That's the fine. Beginning of the tolerance, so yeah. to speak, the other way. Of but once you're you know. looking at it, then out with the bad and in with the good, you know, becomes important. So understanding, penetrating, and being critical, critically mindful becomes very important. But that calm, that, that need, that, that ability to resist having to just react instinctually right. to things is, is a prerequisite to being able to choose judiciously which actions to take, whether they be True. body, speech, or mind. Absolutely. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. So, so that's one. So, so, then, so therefore, the reason I'm mentioning this, this infinite interconnectedness, is as long as at even a deep subliminal level we have not really trodden and, and in a way passed the test of the first branch of the Eightfold Path, realistic worldview, which will make us feel infinitely connected. The realistic worldview is that we are infinitely connected. So we're here for the duration. And for example, it's that thing that I think I told you already about being on the subway. You know, you get locked up on the subway with all the people in it, and you're going to be there forever as far as Henry Kissinger tells you, <laughs> CIA or whoever it is. And then you just really have to take everybody. They have to be your family in a way. You have to really look at them like you would look at your family. And you have to really take care of all of them. You can't just be, ignore them and jump out at the next station because you're there with them. Similarly, all beings are like that with us. We're like stuck with each other forever. <laughs> That's what a shock that is. I mean, here we are comfortable and nice, with smiling faces, everybody's happy, we're in the bed out. But, but you know, forever, you know. And, uh, or even take your actual family. You want to be with them all forever? <laughs> Woo! And, uh, and, you know, maybe. Some of them, and maybe all of them when they're in their best moods. But the point is, that's the point. When everyone's in their best mood, it's no problem to be with everyone. And that's why, like, OK, everyone's your mom, then they'll be for you. So fine. And you feel, that you feel like being a mom to everyone, like a Buddha, then that's fine. So it becomes extremely logical to have the awakening mind or the spirit of enlightenment to have that orientation when you're forced to seek to optimize your relationship with all beings because you're stuck with them forever. Do you follow me? If we're stuck together forever, we have to have the best possible relationship. It's intolerable to have the worst one or even half good, half bad. We want it to be the best. And if, you, if you're in love with everyone in the world, then you want, then the, other, the second thing is it becomes enlightened self-interest. You want them all to be in love with you. And the only way they're really going to be in love with you is if they are Buddhas. So you want them to be Buddhas. You know, right? Isn't that not logical? The opposite of that is the samsara where you yourself are afraid of everybody else, pretty much, at a deep level, you know. As my friend used to say, when the Titanic is sinking, it's every bodhisattva for himself. <laughs> he was being cynical, you know, sarcastic. That's a good one. Uh, you know, Joel, that's Joel. That's you know? a good one. And, but he would used to say that when you'd come to a buffet, you know, say every bodhisattva for himself. So the point is, if, you, if you're like that, which we all are, and even we're taught to think in our culture that that's the healthy way to be, that's the right way to be, and then we therefore automatically project to whatever way we are on everybody else. So we think they're all there out for themselves. So then naturally we're a little concerned about their agendas, how they might influence us. And so it's, the, you know, under stress, it's Hobbes 
Hobbes's war of all against all, and that's the worst way of being. Everybody's like trying to like feather their own nest, but everybody else is trying to take away the feathers, and everybody loses, basically. <laughs> Nobody can defeat everybody else. And everybody's in that bad situation, right? So that's the samsara. The opposite of that, the Buddha verse, everybody's in love with everybody else. Meaning, doesn't mean they want to marry them or whatever, it just means they want them to be happy, genuinely. It's part of their self-interest that the others are happy. So there's no duality, like, well, maybe now I'm going to do a little something for myself, and then now I'm going to work to make you happy. No. If from what, I, what I want to do for myself is have you be happy. It's unified, you know what I mean? Right? So that is the context, and therefore, when we begin to see this thing about patience particularly, we get into this wild stuff about the enemy and about how Shantideva would rather die than become truly filled with anger and hate against even the most horrible enemy. In other words, to succumb to anger and hate is worse than being killed by the hated enemy, the hateful enemy. To be killed without being angry at your killer is more valuable to you evolutionarily than it is to use anger to fight back that enemy or to defend you. Do you follow me? It's very, very radical, therefore. And I wrote, that's why I wrote this book, I wrote Infinite Life, and I, I, Shantideva was my basis in that book, and um, I have a commentary on this chapter and the other chapter on that basis. Because I felt that people read it and they go, oh, it's so nice, so nice, but when you get to the deep points like that one you read about even my enemy, people can't follow there because, you know, they, our culture, all we are is our body, you know. We're taught that. And even we have some yearning or some spiritual glimpse we sort of, that seems to be ground realistic to us, practical realistic. And then therefore it makes no sense that I would rather die than lose my temper. But that's maybe the only way to really conquer hatred and anger, is to make, have it be that, that forceful a reaction against it internally. Okay? So the first thing he says now, he, the, these people, everybody translate those uh, three poisons or three kleshas. Klesha comes from a Sanskrit word klish, which means to twist. And they call it an affliction. But actually, it, you know, desire or hatred is not so much, it is a bit of an affliction, in the sense that when you feel angry or you feel that you hate something or someone, it makes you feel unhappy. It kind of twists you up, and then you get all twisted up by your hatred or your anger. So it's like that. And they call it an affliction. But uh, the affliction is the suffering itself. But sometimes anger makes you feel, when you express it better, because it makes you think you're strong and you can attack someone. Or, and, and, and desire or lust can make you feel somehow inflated in a certain way. And so I like addiction. I like to translate it as addiction. We're addicted to these emotional reactions. And because we and well, why? Because we think they're going to make us feel better, but they don't. A lot of people have come to read them as signs of strength. So a person who gets angry about a point, exactly. like rhetorically and politically, typically, is they, they're doing that in many cases deliberately right. because it lends strength to an otherwise hollow argument. Right. You know? So anyway, the first thing Shanti David does in four or five verses, which we don't need to read, is he talks all the way up to verse six. The key thing, first key, is to decide that anger slash hatred is always bad. When you feel it, you feel bad. When, you, when other people act out of it toward you, they harm, they're harmful. When you feel that way, it harms you. you know, and, and uh, of course, modern medicine agrees psychology. Dan Goldman has edited a great book from one of those dialogues with Dalai Lama about called Destructive Emotions. It creates you know, arterial sclerosis. Cortisol is released in your system. It brings on heart attacks and things. It's, it's really bad for your system. Anger is. And uh, so that's the first thing. It's just going to make you feel bad. It's a bad thing. So it's like an addict. The thing that you're addicted to is just bad. It doesn't have any redeeming quality. That's the first point for an addict to try to overcome an addiction. And the second one I particularly like, 
beginning on verse 7. Yes, 7 is great. Having found its fuel of mental unhappiness in the prevention of what I wish for and in the doing of what I do not want, hatred increases and then destroys me. And um, so this is his analysis. Why do we get angry? Well, something that we don't want to see happening is happening. Or something that we do want to see happening is being prevented from happening. And then we become this mental unhappiness is a way of, it could be translated as frustration. At first, we're frustrated. And then that frustration, that's the fuel. That's the fuel. It's not the fuel of mental, it's the fuel which is mental unhappiness. And the, uh, the translation that I'm reading, I don't know what they say there. Getting what I do not want and all that hinders my desire in discontent, my anger finds its fuel. From this okay, it grows that's good. That's and better down. That's a better translation. Are we, I think we I'm sorry, it's set number seven. Oh, yeah, this version, six. okay. Oh, you have a different Yeah, 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 this version. No numbers on yours. I hope sorry. I did a better job. Like Where is it? Six. Food. Hate finds its food in the mental discomfort I feel faced with the unwanted happening and the blocking of what I want to happen. It then explodes and overwhelms me. That's my translation. I think it's better. <laughs> of course I do. <laughs> but sometimes I don't. Sometimes when I read it later, then I'm critical. I want to improve it always. You know, you're never satisfied with something you write or translate. But this time, I think it's better in either one. The, this original one, the fuel of mental unhappiness that Stephen Batter did, it, that would make you think it's the fuel that feeds mental unhappiness, whereas it should be the fuel which is mental unhappiness. That's the fuel of anger, in other words. Its fuel means anger's fuel, which is mental unhappiness. Anyway, never mind. Well, it's important for the next Therefore, year. I should totally eradicate the fuel of this enemy, for this enemy has no other function than that of causing me harm. That's, again, just harping on how anger is always harmful. And this is key. Whatever befalls me, I shall not disturb my mental joy. For having been made unhappy, I shall not accomplish what I wish, and my virtues will decline. So in other words, when you see something that's happening that you don't like, or when something you would really think you should happen is being blocked, and you start to feel frustrated and unhappy, then you realize that's the fuel that's going to build up and it's going to explode into anger. So you should then, do, that's when you should be, by being aware and mindful of how your mental mechanisms go, that's where you should act to prevent anger. Eliminate the cause to and, the effect. Yes. And then he, so then he says, why be unhappy about something? Oh, I should read, I'm sorry, I should read mine. I'm being too humble. Seeing that, I should carefully eliminate the food that gives life to the enemy. For that enemy has no activity at all other than causing me harm. Whatever happens, I must not allow my cheerfulness to be disturbed. This I like. This is like, like the British thing, you know, having a spot of tea, being of good... Or even, I think there's something in the Bible where Jesus says to people, be of good cheer. Michael Beck with the black preacher, he gave a whole sermon on be of good cheer. It's a good one. And that's a, of course, right? Jesus said that because he said it in the King James Bible in English. <laughs> Never mind. I don't know what they said in, in, in Greek or Hebrew or whatever. But, so this one, whatever happens. So then, why be unhappy about something if it can be fixed? If it cannot be fixed, what does being unhappy help? Right? So this is key. Whatever it is, you just don't be unhappy. You don't get frustrated. That's the, that is the key point. And actually, in the commentaries on this, when something's going wrong, act assertively, forcefully, before your frustration builds into anger. So get out and protest. Say, hey, that's wrong. Don't do that. Right? You know, April and Glaspie, when Saddam Hussein said, well, he might invade Kuwait, she said, well, I'll call Washington. Whatever. Right? Then they nuked the guy. So instead, oh, don't do that. You know, act forcefully in a calm way. That would be really bad. We'll but definitely, my president will come and bomb you if you do that. Don't do that. You know, right away, prevent it. I found, you know, one time 
in giving, I give, of course, I've given whole seminars on anger. Actually, again, Sharon Salzberg and I just finished a book that will be published next fall about, about anger, which I hope will, the title keeps changing by the publisher, but at the moment it's going to be called Love Your Enemies because it will drive them crazy. <laughs> Which, which I like. I saw it in a movie that I like. But anyway, so in a, in a movie about a black church, which I really like. Love your enemies because it'll drive them crazy. And then they wrote some other stuff to make it sort of seem less whatever. But the uh, point is they'll be crazy with happiness if you love them. Loving them is sensible. It's practical. Loving them means wanting them to be happy. I think it's in the Nagarjuna, too, that we read. What? It was in the Nagarjuna as well. It says, we'll displease your enemies. Yes. To, because uh, once they're happy, the reason your enemy is making harm to you is they think you are a block to their happiness. Something about you is preventing them from being happy. So they got to get rid of you or destroy you or take your stuff or whatever it is they want to do to you. And then they'll be happy. So if they are happy to start with, then why are they bother to bother with you? They're not going to harm you. They're going to be happy without getting you out of their way of their happiness. Right? So it's sensible. It's not impractical idealism as modern psychology would say about Jesus' statement, or Buddha had made the same statement in India, only love can stop hatred, you know, he said that. And uh, 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 it's practical. So anyway, so when you see the bad thing happening or the good thing not happening, be forceful in a calm manner. Be forceful in a friendly way. Be intervene. Don't be polite. Be, you know, do everything you can. And if you still can't stop it, don't be frustrated and miserable on top of that. Then try to make the best of the next situation. You know, move on like that. You know, so, but stay happy, whatever you do. Then you won't blow up. And the key there is, I think, the, the commentary gets into how when you feel too not strong enough to prevent a bad thing happening or make a good thing happen, the trick of anger is to tell you that, well, you're not strong enough, but if you blow your top, they'll you be so that. scared of you, or you'll have so much extra strength, then you'll get it done. Right. Which is illusory, because what happens is you overdo, and then the people are even worse, you know, because your judgment is impaired. And they have all these psychological studies you can find in Dan Goldman's thing, called, and the Dalai Lama's thing called destructive emotions. That, that when people lose their temper, their judgment is de deteriorates. They get into tunnel vision, and they don't, they're not skillful in whatever they do. And they're destructive, even to themselves. Right? And we know people will commit suicide out of anger. Often suicide is caused by someone being angry at someone else. And they're, they're making me unhappy, so that they'll make themselves really unhappy and kill themselves. That's really, that shows how powerful the negative energies of the mind are, you know. And in a way, it shows how realistic the multi-life, infinite interconnected Buddhist worldview is, in the sense that, you know, anger will make you kill yourself. Sure. So, if you learn to be willing to give your life never to be angry, you're going to be finding eternal life. Oh, that's what... But uh, Jesus are saying, you know, I really like that. <laughs> I know, but it's crazy from a materialistic point of view, because materialistic point of view is just me and get my space and get out of here and I'm not connected to any way, get out of my world, right? I always joke about the Bush family. George Bush felt he couldn't be on the same planet with Saddam Hussein. He's going to have a grandchild with a mustache at birth who will smoke a cigar and have an affinity for Arabic. A grandchild. And probably wreck all his cars. Get out there and wreck his limos as soon as he can drive. <laughs> Sorry. But because you're not getting anybody out of this world, you know. They'll all come back. And if you kill somebody in a previous life, they'll be really mad at you. Anyway. So, so then he goes on here. Now, they're said to be the first. Then after this, he gets going on it, on the antidotes, right? And from, from this verse, 
cause for happiness sometimes happens. Causes of suffering are very many. But without suffering, there is no transcendence. So, my mind, you must be brave. Shantideva always likes to talk to his mind. It means his, his self-centered mind. And his wisdom mind and his self-centered mind always have this dialogue. So when he says, so my mind, he's talking to his, his self-centered mind. You must be brave. And this first part is called the patience of... Uh, of voluntary suffering. It's, a, it's the first level of patience. And it's like no pain, no gain type of patience. Or tolerance. Sometimes the word tolerance is just as good. Tolerance, patience. You know, tolerance. So, you know, we will go out and, you know, to lose weight or to get in training or get in shape and we'll inflict pain on ourselves, uh, running or pushing ourselves or whatever to build up greater health. You know, we, you no know, pain, no gain, right? We do that normally. So the first level of voluntary suffering is that which does not kill me makes me stronger. Sort of and strength idea. and endurance. Yeah, strength and endurance. So all of these things, you know, he talks about. You know, you know, I'll learn to, I'll learn to be, do this, and then I'll be able to take whatever it is. And um, and um, nothing that which does not become easier to bear through constant practice. Thus, by practicing with little pains. You should learn to endure great pains. There he's talking to his mind, you know, the you. Who has not experienced this with accidental pains, bites of insects and of snakes, pangs of thirst and hunger and so on, and irritations such as rashes. And he goes on like that. And then suffering has a benefit. Being tired of it dispels our arrogance. It stirs our compassion for cyclic creatures. It makes us shun sin and love virtue. And I don't get, OK, so that's up to there. That's, that's up to that verse. He's cultivating the tolerance of voluntary suffering. OK? No pain, no gain. Then from this one on, I'm not angry with the major sources of suffering, ill humor, such as bile. So why am I angry with mental beings all driven by competitions as they are? So then the next series of verses up to, um, I forgot, I see the number. Well, this is kind of interesting. This is the technique of getting rid of the object of the anger. Yeah, this is the, the combination of the wisdom of selflessness. Right. And it's called the patience of knowing reality, through knowing reality. And here it's where it's, in a way, it's making us self-conscious, a kind of mindfulness, critical mindfulness. For example, if someone hits you with a, if someone steps on your toe, you're not angry with their foot. And actually, you're not even angry with them if it was a genuine accident. You're annoyed that your toe hurts, but you're not really angry with the person because you realize they didn't see you. They were like walking backwards, or somebody pushed them. Do you know what I'm saying? You, your, your conceptual narrative, your story about the hurt that you experience, the harm that you experience, affects your emotional reaction, even immediately. The reason we get really angry is we feel there's an agency in the other person that wanted to hurt us. And then we really get angry. And if they hit us with a stick, we're not angry with a stick. That's actually what hit us. We're not, not angry with their hand, with the muscle, the shoulder, with their brain even. We're angry with the person who decided they would hit us with a stick. So we, we create like a conscious agency that has the freedom of choice that could have chosen not to hit us, who hits us. And what Shantideva is doing is by pushing the analytic wisdom that looks and says, well, that person, people behave in these mechanical ways. They're not in control of themselves. So why am I hating them? Right, why not get angry at the ideas or the, the habits underlying that unconscious behavior? Something like behavior, that. If, and know. if they're malicious toward us, it's because they're angry with us and they hate us for whatever reason. So it's actually the hatred is driving them. They're just a machine driven by the hatred. So the only thing to be angry with is the, is the hatred itself. So I should be angry with hatred. But then if I'm angry with hatred or if I hate hatred, then I can't hate it really. <laughs> Because then I've embraced it if I hate it. So I can't hate hatred, in other words. Right? right? So that's the second level. And it involves bringing critical wisdom into it. It's nothing personal. What? It's nothing personal. Nothing personal, right. In a way, it's the connection with the, 
with the um, uh, realization of personal selflessness or subjective selflessness. And so that's what he goes into here, you know. These conditions gathered together have no intention to let us produce harm, nor does their product, harm itself, intend I am going to be produced. Even the postulated agents, the soul stuff, the theoretically imagined self, would never act thinking voluntarily, I must arise as the cause of harm. So if the self were permanent, as claimed by, you know, the, he, here as he's talking about certain Indian philosophers, it clearly must be inactive just like space because a permanent thing cannot change. Even on encounter with other conditions, what could it do without changing itself? And these are, these are from the wisdom thing of, um, of um, seeing through, the, through that, okay? So that's if I see enemy or friend do something wrong, skipping the next page, page four, fourth line down, I will keep my good cheer. Either enemy or friend, this comes from mechanical conditions. If it was voluntarily happening, since no one wants to suffer, no embodied being whatsoever would ever experience suffering. So in other words, this is, this, it's a way of deconstructing the sort of agency in the other person, which is the will to hurt you. Well, I particularly like, I mean, this one, this, the second one that you just read, if things could be, this is different translation, yep, but yep. If, if things could be according to their wish, no suffering would ever come to anyone of all embodied beings. Right. I, if, we, if, if, if it was intentional, everything would be fine. Right. It's kind of an interesting right. point to make. Because no one wants to around. Suffer. Right. If in the power of addictive emotions they kill even their cherished selves, how would they fail to cause harm to the bodies of other beings? Thus compelled by addictions when they try such things as killing me, perhaps it's hard to feel compassion, but what's the point of getting angry? It is natural for the immature to cause harm to others. It is wrong to get angry with them, like resenting fire for burning. All right, when you burn yourself on a hot pot of fire, you don't get angry at the heat, because you realize it's just, a, it's a, it's just a, a bad condition, a bad condition. And so he goes on like that, and that's where he ends it here. Two sticks and so on really hurt me, I still get angry with the thrower. But he is also an instrument moved by hate, so I'm only right, rightly angry with hate. Okay, so now that's up to there. Now the last kind is called the patience of non-retaliation. Buddhism being always very conservative in what it talks about, I call it the patience of forgiveness. Because you give back, you sort of forgive the other, so there's no need for revenge or retaliation or reaction. So, but the literal meaning is non-reaction or non-retaliation. And it begins, begins by beginning to see your infinite interconnection with beings in a way where you take responsibility for everything that happens to you in the sense that you did, you put causes into the infinite interconnected web that come back to you in the form of harm. So this is where, this is a very interesting thing. Sadly, people misunderstand karma and they use it to blame the victim. Like poor Sharon Stone got in trouble when there was a terrible earthquake in China by saying on the media, well, if they weren't so nasty to Tibetans, they wouldn't have had a terrible earthquake. And right. then everybody, including all the Buddhists, really got on her case, which they should have. It was right. a complete, there she's personifying karma as some kind of like, Poetic, vengeful poetic fate. justice or something. Vengeful fate. Right. So the Bodhisattva or the Buddhist folk will never, never think that. Never say it, never think it. Except when it happens to them. <laughs> this is a strange paradox. When a bad thing happens to you, the most powerful thing you can do about it, in a spiritual sense, is yourself take responsibility for it. I know this sounds really weird. In other words, blame yourself when you're the victim. And why is that the most powerful thing? Well, I always say that it takes the insult out of the injury. But uh, yeah, oh, that's a good way of putting it. You know, that's felicitous. I mean, you can't do you can't do much about the injury. It's occurring. It's yeah. happening. But you can control your reaction to it. So therefore, this the, the idea of taking taking responsibility or taking it on. You know, it's like the person gets hit with a meteor. You know. 
It's, one, it's bad enough to be hit by the meteor, but then the sense of why me? Yeah, right. <laughs> on top of it all, being singled out by the entire universe. Right. Seems a bit much and not really particularly helpful and useful. So you just assume, why not me instead? I know. For some reason, the meteor seems you know? to always hit the Russians. Well, <laughs> why did even the dinosaurs were the Easy Russian now, dinosaurs? Sharon. Easy, Sharon. What? Easy now, Sharon. <laughs> No, but that meteor blew up yeah, the, the, the one in, uh, in Siberia. I know, yeah, and then nice the Russians supply. are like, you know, maybe they're better at taking responsibility. Anyway, I, I love them, don't, don't get me wrong. Ever since I saw, well, no, from reading Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and Turgenev and things in my youth, I got to like them. And then again, in the modern time, that movie, Moscow Does Not Believe in Tears, I really like the Russian people. And then I've been traveling and teaching Dharma there. They're so interested in the Dharma, the Russian people. They're wonderful, really. They really are. In a way, they were so per they, 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 they let the communist form of, of dictatorship oppress them because they weren't nice, nice in a way. They were too nice. They were sweet. They were definitely nicer than their oppressors, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, the oppressors were also Russian, but I'm just saying, you know, there's of course usually, bad people. That's I'm usually not, the case with oppressors. Yeah, they're really, the bad people came to the top and really afflicted them. In our case, we're so all half bad ourselves, so we usually tend to get rid of the bad people somewhat. Because we're a little, you know, it's like the Archie Bunker theory, right? Give everybody a gun. When you check on the airplane, they give you your ticket, your boarding pass, and a gun. <laughs> so. Bullets. So then everybody, the whole airplane is bristling with guns, so no terrorists would ever come. Because everybody's got a gun. I think the problem is they would shoot holes in the, shoot holes in the skin of the airplane and they'd all like suffocate, but never mind. Yeah, I don't know. But that was Archie Bunker's famous solution to terrorists. It's just, it's, when you check on a plane, they, they give you a body pass and they give you a gat. And everybody has a gat on a plane and nobody ever try to hijack a plane. <laughs> It's like give the whole the three-year-olds like their own gun in kindergarten. Yeah. <laughs> then the crazy people won't come with the with the assault weapons. A man in Panama. Never mind. So here's where it begins. Long ago I inflicted harm of this kind on being so causing injury to them. Now this harm comes back to me. His weapon and my body both are causes of my suffering. He made the weapon, I the body. With whom should I be angry? So this is the thing where when you blame yourself, when something bad happens to you, you are the person who you, you are the thing which you can do something about. You can try to turn this injury into something that you can develop by. You can make it an advantage for you. You can make it a challenge. You can make yourself stronger with it and so on. And if you take it in the right way, and you don't externalize your reaction and say, oh, you know, that's like that. So you can't really do anything about all the whole, all the rest of the universe. You can definitely change yourself. So that's, that's the thing. You don't have to worry about the insult. You take rid of insult and you say, okay, the injury itself is going to be something I'm going to use to grow. So in a way, and, and of course, it's very deep, you know, his, so I made the body. What does he mean by I made the body? He means I made the body because my previous life, what I did, created this body the way it is. And by the way, beautiful people are beautiful because they were patient in previous lives. The, the karmic, the evolutionary cause of beauty is patience. So this patience practice this is beautification practice, guys. Forget about Estee Lauder and all of this, and spas and things. Practicing patience is anger makes ugliness. You know, uh, ugliness comes from anger. You know, and, and beauty comes from patience. So anyway, so then blind with craving, if I cling to this human form so prone to suffering, agonizing to the touch like an open sore, whom should I hate when it is hurt? And so this goes on, you know, compelled by my evolutionary actions, my karma that is, others come forth to harm me. When that sends them to hell, have I not caused their downfall? So here is completely reconceptualizing the kind of war of all against all. Since I've gotten in the way of these people, then they harm me, then they have a terrible 
thing. I doesn't hurt, doesn't bother me. Even they kill me because I'm going to stay happy. You die happy, you're reborn happy. You die angry, you're reborn bad, miserable. But you die happy, you're reborn happy. And actually, death is not that bad. You know, I once gave a series of lectures on the Book of the Dead, and one lady, I didn't like it, so it made me nervous. I didn't know about my insurance. But one lady was there and said, Oh, Bob, the Tibetans make death seem like so much fun, I can't wait to try it. <laughs> And you know, the French call an orgasm, they call it le petit mort, you know, the little death. So the actual, once you let go of the body, and then all those NDE books, you know, near-death experiences, they're constantly going on about how there I was, and I was meeting my guide, and, you know, Avalokiteshvara, or Jesus, or whatever, Socrates, whoever it was, and... Uh, and then she says, sorry, it's not your time. You have to go back. You know, I just had an auto accident. I was on the operating table. And then suddenly, wham, I was back in my body. And I was really bummed. I said, no, no, I don't want to go back. Yeah. And there's a lot of that in there. So, so, so death, it isn't that bad, actually. And it isn't nothing is key. It's not as good as nothing. But it can be way better than nothing if you die happy. That's key. And the only way you can die happy is if you're not angry with the causes of whatever you're dying about. That's, that's the only way you can die happy. So then, relying on them with patience, these enemies who harm me, relying on them with patience, do, not, do I not purge myself of many sins? Yet when they relate to me with harm, do they not suffer long the pains of hell? Since thus I injure them by being here as a target of their harm, and thus they benefit me, why so perversely savage mind do you feel anger toward them? I mean, really, it's kind of amazing. You know, when you get into, con it's like when you get into conflict with someone, right, it sort of gets down to yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, like children get into, you know? Yes, no, yes, no, you know? Or no, yes, no, yes, it goes like that. So. If you're the one who reacts to no with like, great, <laughs> okay, <laughs> forget yes. It's great. Suddenly you have up leveled the whole interaction, and in a way, you're you're no person over there. It's like, they, well, come on, my no has no f nothing. To, if you're not gonna come back with yes, that's why I say it, it will drive them crazy. You know, that's why they said it on that church billboard. If I have the excellence of patience, I'll never stay in hell. So I protect myself this way. In other words, I will never go toward the really bad state of existence. Well, you know, you know, although the Buddhists have a very vivid visualization of hell. Trust me, it's really bad. They're even so bad that Buddha said people shouldn't meditate on it, or they'll get depressed unless they're really thinking a lot about compassion and so on. And seeing the Buddha verse and the positive, uh, the infinite positivity of the universe. My own conduct will... You know, although I protect myself this way, how will it be for them? Yet if I retaliate or gain revenge by harming them, that will not serve to protect them. My own conduct will be destroyed and all my discipline will be for naught. So I can't fight back, I can't harm them back. Then I'm like, I'm going, to, I'm going down evolution-wise. So in other words, it's the vision of the infinite connectedness. Whatever happens to me, I guard my wisdom mind, my loving mind, my compassion mind, my patience mind, my tolerance mind. And I never give way to my hatred, anger, delusion, three poisons mind, you know, my three poisons mind. I do not. And he, he argues back and forth with himself. These dashes are, you know. You know, you... So, so he says, you know, what's the use of... of, of uh, of doing these things, and don't be mad. This one, you know, should people slander or even destroy icons, sacred monuments, or scriptures by hatred would be inappropriate since Buddhas and so on cannot be injured. This verse is so important. When they blew up the Buddhas in Bamiyan, you know, the, the Taliban, the people in the press called me and they said, well, aren't you mad they blew up the Taliban? I said, no. Shantideva said, don't be mad. It's a silly thing they do and it'll make them unhappy, bad luck for them. But, you know, since I conceive the spirit of it, it's not the problem. If they're harmful to the women of Afghanistan, that's worse. 
since I conceived the spirit of enlightenment by wanting all beings to find happiness, why do I become angry when they find happiness on their own? So anyway, that's that. So, okay, that's enough on anger, I think. Any question about anger? Anybody? Any question? Gandhi, you want to say anything about the anger thing? Well, no, I thought it's really of extreme. Jealousy in throughout this whole thing, which I thought was sort of... What? What was the whole... I just, I was a little... In rereading it, I was a little confused of the... Um, Oh, that's later in the, the compassion. Jealousy. The, the, well, we'll the come jealousy. back. That's what I wanted to move ahead on. What the relationship was between anger and jealousy yeah, in this, yeah. in this I wanna, I wanna come back. analysis. I want to come back. It seems to me that there's a dependent. I'm sorry, yes, good. It seems like there's a, a contradiction in, in that we hold other people not accountable due to the issue, the concept of causality. Can you speak in a strong voice? I'm sorry. It seems. It seems contradiction, like yes, contradiction. because. Because we, when we look at other people and their actions, and yes. the harm that they're causing to themselves and to others, yes. we say it's not really volitional. We say that it's based on the idea of karma and yes. causality. But when we look at our own suffering, it seems like we're taking free will into account and saying, yes, what I do matters in, right. in relation to myself. So how do you... It's appropriate to judge yourself because you can at least have some understanding of, of yourself, but you don't necessarily know the others. I mean, I just, it's just more, I think it's, it has to do with it being efficacious. There's no, it is a definite contradiction. Absolutely, because the two contexts are different. In other words, you're, you yourself, normally, when you just react habitually if someone crosses whatever your line is, and you can't control that and you just freak out, then you actually are acting without free will, right? So you're seeing others as having acting without free will. When you're using the way you're seeing them to counteract your habitual way of seeing them, of yourself reacting without free will and attributing them free will of malicious choice to harm you and thereby being angry with them. So you're, you, you're, you're taking the paradoxes which abound in contradiction and you're using them in a way to diminish your helplessness to your reaction of anger, right? And even it gets to this extreme thing where you're saying, Wow, the more they hurt me, the better I am. It's really great. Until you finally feel, well, gee, I'm really hurting them by letting them be there, to ha letting, being here myself for them to hurt me. And then the, the debating mind, the final point, which, we, which I, I just skipped over, but because I want to get to the next thing. But the debating point was, well, maybe I should hurt them back because then they can control their anger. You know, and then I'll be harming them, and oh, that's terrible. I'll get a bad result from that. But there'll be a good result by being patient with me harming them. You know, his, his ego mind tries to trick him like that, so then he can react again. But then he says, no, that won't do go, because when you harm them, if they're not practicing to use the harm in this opposite way, the way that normal people react to harm, then it'll just make them more angry and they'll harm you, and it'll be an endless cycle, vicious cycle. So don't use that trick to pretend, okay, I can now react angrily and be harmful to them, because then they'll get the virtue of being patient. Because they won't necessarily, they'll become angry, you know. So you're absolutely right. These are, because these, these are methods of, of, of using the double bind element in life, etc., in this certain way. And also there are these different levels. The level where you're developing the knowledge of reality, you are not focusing on how you did something bad in the previous life. You're focusing only on how this is like an involuntary process and the only bad thing in the involuntary process is hatred itself. So therefore you can't do hatred. And that's just a level. Then when you, where I made that transition to the next verse, and you know where that, where that was, you know, the, uh, I forgot which one it was, but when, you, when I made that transition, the next thing begins with, oh, now everything that bad happens to me is my thing. And then you're switching and you're starting to take responsibility for your freedom of choice. Do you follow me? So you're, because you're upping the level, you've reached the level where you've seen it all um, devoid of, 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 of uh, almost like people have no free will. And, but you, of course, in doing that, you're exercising free will to avoid attributing malevolent agency to anything other than the hatred in the other people, which then causes you to want to get rid of the hatred in yourself. Then, the next level, you're emphasizing your free will because by having reached that level, you begin to have some choice. And then, in that case, you're not concerned with them and their free will or non-free will because you're just using whatever harm they dish out to you to develop yourself. So you just have to see it in a sequence like that. 
Okay, and that should help you with the contradiction. But it is, and but of course, not, it's, not it's a total contradiction. In life, we're supposed to defend ourselves, fight back, get the enemy, preemptive strikes. It goes on like that. That's the that's a normal well, samsaric thing. But you can oppose an action without being hateful. I mean, if you want, if you, it has to, I mean, if it's applied no, 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 to no, some no. kind of social theory, it's going to get a bit weird when you just let people no, it run does around get and go trampling on everybody no. else. Well, wait, I'm coming to that. I'm just saying that therefore, when you, know. you go all the way on that, and you truly develop the highest level of patience, which is the patient of forgiveness, the patient of non-retaliation, then you're capable of letting your enemy kill you and dying happy or even killing people around you and dying, you're capable of that, without anger at any of it. But then, when you're capable of that, there is a moment where you think, well, wait a minute, I could let this all be destroyed, and that no, nothing that they do to me will cause me to give in to anger, I'm patient no matter what. But now I have to start thinking about their situation. And in their situation, Letting them harm me, letting them kill other people, oh, that's not good. So then I have to take concern for them. So then you can act forcefully, actually, because you'll never act angrily. You follow me? When you reach the point where you would, I'll put it this way, when you're willing to die without anger and without hatred and without causing harm in a destructive way, then you can live. You follow me? And, and what you do in life could be forceful. And then you're beginning to get into the thing about surgical violence, preventing other violence, and you're going into that. But only, as far as your own spiritual growth goes, only when you've reached that point where you'd be able to die without harming anybody. You follow me? Even to save your life. Or even to save the life of your dear one. You know, in the Jewish religion, and which then trickles down into Christianity and Islam, the famous sacrifice by Abraham of Isaac is a sign that the divine wants people to be able to even give up attachment to the other, to their loved one, you know, the one who they love more than themselves, their children. And in the Buddhist tradition, in the life before the Buddha became Buddha, he gave his children away to some creepy old, like Scrooge McDuck type, who, <laughs> who had heard he was someone who had a vow to give anything to everyone even his own blood, his head, his life, whatever. But the hardest thing for him to give was his children. And, and then he also gave his wife. His wife came back and passed out when she heard he'd given away the children. And then somebody came and said, well, I'll have her too. And he gave her away. <laughs> but he had told them when he married her, he would give anybody away. So don't marry me. You know, I, was, I give anything. That's my thing in life. So it's that same Abraham Isaac thing, you know. It's really that spirituality, the spiritual thing is a really deep thing. But then if someone has achieved that, then there's a second thing about defending something, ameliorating the violence, team, so to speak. helping the enemy not cause harm and make themselves, then because there's no more of the element. In a way, when you're developing your own patience out of an interaction, you're still having a, your personal or selfish spiritual purpose is still there. And they're completely aware of that. If you so you're using the situation. But what is also very contradictory to what normal people do is, instead of using every situation to aggrandize yourself or to defend yourself aggrandizing, you're using the situation to, to aggrandize yourself in a multi-life spiritual level of Buddhahood rather than in just this body life. So you're living in this other context. But it's not meaningful in the materialist world where all we are is this body. If you follow me? Which is why I wrote the Infinite Life book. Because I was tired of people going, oh, I love Shanti Deva and patience and everything. But no one willing to really follow the, 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 the level of that. You know? Or what the Tibetans call the mind transformation, you know, or, my, or what I call mind reform practice, where you know, the, one of the verses says, in whatever it is, let the, let the enemy have the victory. I want to be the lowest of all. Let all the others like have all the victories, and I'll just be the lowest. You know, they, it goes on, on like that, and then, and people, oh, that's so sweet. Of course, I'll never do that. You know, <laughs> these people are crazy. Yeah. You know, but it sounds sweet. Do you know what I mean? But that's that's the shift that the this spirituality, wisdom, spirituality, selflessness, and I think all the world religious traditions have this in their core. This is the only way in which 
the human beings can really live together is, is, is if everybody is like that. And the, the idea that people have, well, other people will not be like that, they'll never be like that. Well, then, they, then that's just an excuse to not really do it yourself, type of thing. But it's a multi-life thing. It's, and after all, you know, I always say that in, when I'm talking ethics and things, world peace, we say. But we can't have world peace because soldiers are too powerful. And what, what gives soldiers their power? It isn't just that they have a gun or a sword or a hatchet or whatever it is. It's that they are trained to give their life, if necessary, to kill same their for, enemy. Same for corporations. What? Same for corporations. Well, whatever. Yeah, the corporations, the nation, the Sacrifice. nations, and it always in terms of it's always in terms of the family and your you know your loved ones, your saving your you know your 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 grandmother. You know, they always put it in those terms. But the point is, they're more powerful than the civilian because they're willing to die. And they're using kind of anger and hatred of an, of an opponent. So when you have world peace is when more people on the planet, and then we even in very militaristic societies like ours, we're taught that that's the only way people will be trained to overcome their survival instinct is by pandering to their hatred, pumping their hatred up to where they, you know, they go out and they bayonet the enemy, you know, they bayonet the, the gook. The, the Viet Cong, the Bennett, the Nazi, the Bennett, the, the whoever is the, the Russian, you know, the Klingon, you know, <laughs> the Bennett, whoever it is, they've made into another species, a non-human entity, right? And, uh, and so we're trained to believe that that's the only way they'll go and jump into the charge of the light brigade, is that kind of anger and hatred. But this tradition in India has taught us, historically, that people can be trained not to do that. They can be trained to give their own life, not to be angry, and not to kill and hurt anybody else. And in a way, the Tibetans nowadays are standing up to that, actually. People don't quite, a lot of people I know, oh, they're horrible committing suicide, oh, that's really bad, they're not, what, they're being very destructive, they're killing themselves, and isn't suicide against it in Buddhism? Yes, it is. But what does suicide mean? It means self-killing. If you have a larger self from life to life, you're just getting rid of a body. You're giving a body to a situation where there's a struggle between bodies. And, uh, in the, and the struggle game and the mutual domination game, you're, you're leaving. You're, and you're giving your thing to, to give a message that hits, why are the Chinese hating it so much? Because subliminally, it shows that life is so miserable in this game of domination and colonization and struggle and imperialism and genocide that it's not worth living in. So take my body, guys. You can't kill me because I'm getting rid of my own body. I'm, it shows that I'm free. That's the warrior who is more powerful than the warrior who just is gonna die while killing the enemy. And it's really marvelous. It shows that the, the tradition is not dead, actually. But I know, but on the other hand, we can't say it too much because then a lot of people will imitate. Like in Vietnam, the Vietnam War, that guy, Thich Kung Duc, I think 63 or 64, he sat down, he was chatting, he wasn't drugged. He was chatting away with folks and hello, and how are you, and you know, en français, you know, speaking French, uh, speaking Vietnamese. And then he sat down, old jolly, <laughs> down himself with gas, <laughs> he's burning. Remember the movie? He's just sitting there in concentration. He's not even twitching, he's not grimacing, he's not freaking out, he's just sitting there. He's moved his mind out of his nervous system, actually, already. And then poof, the thing just, if you remember it, it just sits there like it that. It just collapses. It's Everything collapses. But at yeah. no one point does he freak out. Absolutely not. Showing that this is a gift of a special kind, and it hit everybody in the unconscious on a globally powerful way. Because it was seen. Unfortunately, the Tibetan guys don't have good video. Usually, the terrible cell phone or something, and, they, and, they, and then the Chinese censor the thing, and the Chinese people, if they saw it, they know that Chinese Buddhist people know about that. Taoist people, they know. The Christians, the Falun Gong people, they know about this giving of the self in a certain way. And it's, it is more powerful than the soldier's ability to die while killing somebody. Rambo sort of thing, you know. Anyway, so there's a lot of contradiction. What's this? 
Okay, yes. What movie? What's that? What movie was this? It was a famous protest. The famous in Vietnam. Uh, news reel of the Tri Quang Duc in Vietnam in I, the 65. I think the movie's oh. called Year of the Pig. Wasn't it? Well, I don't know. Movie? There was and a full you, you video about it, it but it just, it's a two, two or three minute thing you watch. You can probably find it on YouTube, even today. And it's incredible. Well, it, it's so incredible. It's so moving. And what I was going to say was then after that, there were a couple of French monks and a couple of other people. They came in and, uh, and they lived in, oh man, they went and jumped in a canal. <laughs> they went and jumped in canals. Wasn't Some of them did get, they did die anyway, they, but they weren't really ready. Well, I mean, was, I'm thinking, you know, so the Tibetans are usually running around, the ones who are doing this too now, you know? And no, I think no, the no, 200, that Delhi did. The 200 and some plus South Koreans who did this, I think, in the 70s, I think they have the largest 200, 200 and some odd wow. South Koreans protesting the, you know, whatever regime we had hooked up. In oh, that, the park, that, that, yeah, the father the of the current president. But I think they, they, they have the largest number in the modern really? age. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, they like that. You know? The Koreans and people say, like, some Chinese and Japanese try to come and do our Korean, like, retreat. Forget it. They have to wheel them out of here in a wheelbarrow. So they are very macho. I got really ill, like sitting there in the winter with no heat. It was like even they were bringing me long underwear. I was there last year. They're really macho, the Koreans. They're just like that. Don't crack jokes. But the, the, am, I, am I? Actually, you know, you know, uh, um, what was his name? Kim Dae Jong, who was president of Korea for a while. You know, and who had been he'd almost dumped overboard by the CIA. There was a film you can see where he was being hung out to be dropped into the ocean. And then they decided they got no more Washington, don't kill him. You know, he was like a liberal protesting guy under the old dictator. And uh, he was frustrated. And I have a friend who was his political consultant at some time when he was trying to run for election, and he kept not winning. And then Aquino, Mrs. Aquino won in the Philippines. And he was saying, oh, he was talking to his political advisors in a strategy meeting, saying, maybe I should get myself killed, and then my wife could win the presidency. <laughs> He said, no, no, don't do that. <laughs> and he finally won. But then once he won, he wouldn't invite the Dalai Lama to Korea. And the Chinese pressured him. Anyway, so then, never mind. Thus having considered the excellence of solitude by the many, now we're going to Compassion, chapter 8, verses 90 and following, which is the meditation chapter, actually. By the many themes appreciating its value, I must calm my conceptual agitations and cultivate the spirit of enlightenment. So here's this thing of generating that will to Buddhahood for the sake of all beings, the, t the turning of the heart inside out that is the essence of Shantideva and of Mahayana Buddhism, uh, that is, uh, uh, you know, that is, uh, that is Mahayana Buddhism. So first of all, let me strive to contemplate the quality of self and other. Since we are equal in pleasures and pains, I should guard all others as I do myself. So this is the essence, that's, this is the sort of classical statement of this, although Nagarjuna had the same, he says, oh, your majesty, just like you think about what might be good for yourself, so you should think about all of your subjects, what is good for them. And so this is what this is, is like, we think that it's normal in life. We get up in the morning, we think, what should I do today? What do I, what do I gotta do? What, what do I need to do? to get this and this and that benefit out of the day, to have a good day. What do I need to get? What do I need to do? You know, and we're always thinking, like, what am I getting out of it? What about me? Where am I in this? What is it, what's in it for me? There's all this kind of expression, right? And we, basically, we're prisoners in this vision of a kind of inner monologue of self-preoccupation, is what I like to translate it. We're preoccupied with what's happening to us. And we even think that's correct, healthy, and that's the way to be. But what Shantideva is going to argue here is that that is actually not the way to be. That guarantees our suffering. Because when we're thinking about what we're getting and what's in it for me, there'll never be enough of what is in it for me. We will never be satisfied with what we're getting. We will not feel the benefit is sufficient and we'll be more and more discontented and frustrated. But you know, he doesn't quite jump that right away. First, he just says, that's the way we are. And others are also that way. So everybody else is going around. Like, I'm sitting there, OK, Bob, what are you getting out of this? What are you doing? What should you be doing? What are you going to get from it? And blah, 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 blah. Everybody else is thinking that. 
And actually, there's so many more of them. There's all these little treadmills, mental treadmills of people thinking, what are they getting? What, what are they getting? What about me? Everybody's thinking. And there's a lot more of them, and the same as me. And actually, I think, when I'm thinking about what am I mean, what am I getting? I should get this, I should get that. I should have this drink of water. Then I feel I should have what I want. I have a right to it. Like, I need a drink of water. I, I should have that. And everybody else is thinking that. So there's all this need and demand and things. And so we're totally equal. And so I should be worried about them having a drink of water. Why am I just picking on me having a drink of water? There's a lot more of them. So a lot more need there. That's the first step. Then he, he goes, the so parts of the body such as hands are many. They are one and the same in needing to be protected. So all different beings in pleasure and pain are just like me in wanting to be happy. Right? Everybody here wants to be happy, right? Anybody wanting to be miserable? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> Come on. Oh, look. She's smiling. No, no. Everybody wants to be happy. Now, if my pain, his mind also thinks, you know, does not harm the bodies of others, still that pain of mine becomes unbearable only when identified as mine. And here he's answering and anticipating an objection of his egotistical mind which says, well, yeah, they want to be happy, but their happiness isn't my happiness. I don't feel their happiness. So really, why should I be concerned about it? And why should I be worried about their pain? And he's answering that, well, you could say, then why do I care about my own happiness, my own pain? In fact, I only have a pain because I identify it as mine. And here he is beginning to deconstruct the idea of the human being as an automaton. And he's saying that when you're in a certain state, you have something happen that's painful, but you don't notice it. You know, a hypnotized person, right, they stick a pin, they don't feel it. If you're really preoccupied on something, you might not notice, you know, when you're running or something to win a race or something, you don't notice even you're ripping a tendon or something. If you're people in battle, even a bullet goes through some muscle and they just keep charging and they don't realize they were wounded until later. In other words, there's a mental a whole set of constructs that interpret pain, that feel pain. And so I only identify with my pain because that's what I'm habituated to doing, is what he's saying. So he says, the pains of others do not affect me directly, but if I identified their pains as mine, they too would become hard to bear. And here, you, you know, we do have a human being. The mother really feels that child's pain when it's having colic or indigestion or whatever, or when it's having something more serious. The mother is like racked with concern for that, can really feel it. The lover really feels the pain of the beloved. The teammate feels the pain of the teammate. The buddy in war, you know. We, the human being has flexibility of identification. We can identify with, we do identify with larger groups, with others. We can. So he's saying, when we do, then we can't bear their pain. We know that. So then he's saying, so I must dispel the pains of others because they are pains. No other reason. Just like I don't, when I hurt my hand, I don't say, well, gee, should I? That's only as far, this far away from my brain. You know, it's just a hand, why should I bother? We, you know, what's the reason why I should not have pain in my hand? We don't say that. We just want to get rid of it because it's a pain. That's enough. So similarly, if we identify with others' pain, their pain is no good, we want to get rid of it, that's enough. When I and others both are alike in wanting happiness, what's so special about me that I strive for my happiness alone? When I and others both are alike in not wanting pain, what's so special about me that I guard myself, not others? And now he begin, now his egotistical mind gets into the debate. Well, I don't guard them since their pains don't hurt me. And he says, well, why then do I guard myself from future pains since they also don't hurt me now? That's a smart one. That's really smart. 
right? You don't do things that you know will cause you pain in the future because, but even though you're not feeling that pain in the future when you don't, when you restrain doing something. So you're identifying with a person that doesn't exist yet, right? Because you're not yourself in the future right now. To think I will experience that is a mistaken notion. For the one who dies here is almost totally different from the one reborn. This one, the, this, you know, I put in almost totally so I wouldn't reinforce the materialist idea here. But it's true. I mean, also every cell in our body is different from, uh, ten, from a year ago, mm -hmm. right? There's not one single piece of energy around us or in our body or anything that's the same as a year ago. And yet there's a continuity between, between our two beings. When someone has a pain, that one should guard himself against it, the mind says. And he says, well, the foot, your, foot, your foot's pain is not your hand's. So why then does your hand guard against your foot's pain? He's saying. And then the debater again says, Though the self-concern is not rational. It happens because of the self-habit. And then Shantideva says, but what is irrational for self and others should be abandoned as much as possible. So this is just the beginning of this whole thing. About, you know, the Dalai Lama says of the two precepts, the one where you think of all beings as your mother, and the one where you think of yourself as equal to all beings, because all are equal in, in wanting pleasure and uh, happiness and pleasure and not wanting pain. He likes this one about the equality of everybody, because everybody wants to be happy. He says particularly he's fonder of this one. He gets a little freaked out by the mother one, he used to say. OK. I mean, he admires Mao, who is enemy, having meditated on him. But maybe he doesn't like thinking of Mao as his mother. <laughs> <laughs> He knows Mao wants to be happy. Sure. So then, uh, then you know, there's this thing about the owner of pain. He goes on with it. So, Gunnar, any other ones you want? It, it, you know, you want to pick on some particular ones. We're running short, very short, the, near the end of time. End of the time. I want to come to a couple of things. No, you go ahead. You know, a single pain could abolish many pains. A loving person would feel compelled to undergo that pain for self and other. That's true. We all have that heroic element. And she who detunes her mind like this delights in eradicating others' pains and can plunge into the worst of hell like a wild goose into a lotus lake. That's the Bodhisattva idea. The vast ocean of joy. When all beings are free, am I not satisfied with that? What to do with a solitary freedom? But here, you know, people who don't have a vision that there is such a nirvanic ocean of joy that we can, that is our reality that we can achieve. Of course, this is not such a powerful meaning, meaning, meaningful to them. Thus, during the welfare of beings, I should not be conceited or amazed with myself. Enjoying single-mindedly the welfare of others, I need not expect any rewarding fruit. In other words, you get so much pleasure from bringing about the welfare of others, you don't need any other reward. But here he doesn't say it like virtue is its own reward, like, but it's not that much fun. Here he's saying virtue is fun. So that's the, it's its own reward in that it is the pleasure. That's what he's saying. Thus, as just as I protect myself from unpleasant things, however slight, I should develop a protective concern and a compassionate attitude from others. And then here he goes back again to how my own self-identity of just my own boundary, skin boundary self, it's something I've developed. It's not automatic or innate. So I could consider other bodies as myself, too. And we do sometimes. We fall in love, we have a child, we feel that way. And here, finally, having understood the flaws in self-concern and the ocean of advantages in other concern, I must abandon self-preoccupation and cultivate concern, cultivate concern for others. And. Uh, I want to skip to what I call the Shanti Deva challenge. Although, in a way, each one is good, but I do skip in this thing. Sorry, I'm looking at a different version. All happy, here's the famous one. All happiness in the world arises from the, this I call the Shanti Deva challenge. 
All right. arises from the wish for others' happiness. All suffering in this world arises from the wish for one's own happiness. This is a real talk about contradiction. This is a total challenge to the worldly way of being. And of course, one of the radical things about it, for example, a human being, according to the Buddhist biology, karmic biology, has gotten to be human by being compassionate as the lower types of animals. Some, some beings who become human have descended from heavenly levels, actually. But many more come up from the animal plane. But the only way that you do is by ethics. Humanity comes from ethics, in other words. It's, and what ethics is, other regarding actions. Action that restrains harming others and benefits them by, be, by empathizing with them, imagining being them, and therefore not wanting to cause them harm. And, the, and mammals, for example, are a step up from an egg-laying animal because the mammal brings the, has the young of the, inside the body of the female, more intelligent ones. And so that's already a, a, a kind of sign of altruism. So when one thinks of the happiness of humans, the sensitivity, the ability to experience bliss and joy of the human being, that came from ethics. It comes from a wish for others' happiness, in other words. Yes? If you, if one has realized uh, emptiness, right? From that yes. perspective, from that standpoint of emptiness, wouldn't the self be a kind of other? I mean, wouldn't it be possible? Why, why should it be possible to feel compassion and want to alleviate the suffering of others and not to feel that compassion and want to alleviate Oh, no, no, suffering? nobody's saying you don't feel compassion for yourself. Actually, if you want to be compassionate for yourself, be compassionate for others. Because you'll be free of suffering the more you care for others. The more you care about the more free you'll be. All happiness in this world comes from the wish for happiness of others. So if you, to be compassionate for yourself, you should be more caring for others, actually. And you say about shunyata, yes, shunyata, realizing selflessness, of course, is where you look for a self apart from others and don't find it. And you also don't find a self in others, in a certain sense. But, you know, by your gesture, you're doing what we do when we think about selflessness, me too. We think that we've sort of escaped from the whole thing, of any self or any other, sort of it's all just space or something, you know. What I call the cheap oneness. The oneness of all things where there are no things, which is easy. But what the, the trick of it is, is that when you achieve that, then there's no self that's outside of the previous self that didn't feel it was empty. There's no self that's outside living in an empty space. That is the whole empty space, even. That sense of self that's the whole infinite empty space, after a while, starts getting filled up with other beings. And then, from that perspective, the other beings seem the same as the self. So then, suddenly, one is subjected to the suffering of every being. And that's even when he asked that question, his egotistical mind, why do I want to be compassionate for all beings? Then I'm multiplying my suffering. But the point is that it's this, it's this, it's, everything is paradoxical. When you're completely open to yourself, of course, you don't feel any suffering yourself. Then you see other beings as all open of themselves. And in a way, you see that all their sufferings are unreal. And it all disappears. Then the disappearance disappears. And everybody's back. And then everybody's a little suffering in an unreal way. So in a way, that suffering isn't hopeless. You realize they can be free of it. So then, it's all equal. You're worrying about them and yourself. But there's a lot more of them. So therefore, it's like, it's like your own self. You have a, you've had a, you grew up with a pain in your chin. 
and you are like always oh, nagging you and there's pain in my chin. Then you get, you have an auto accident, you have pain all over. And then it's not that you don't care about the pain, continuing pain in your chin. It's like there's a lot more pain. So the chin one suddenly that's lesser in dimension. And then, and even you, you might, because you are like broke every bone in your body, you might, you might not even notice that pain you've been living with forever with your chin. Do you know what I'm saying? And so it goes like that. But luckily, Buddha, at the same moment that Buddha, oh no, I have a pain <laughs> in my computer. <laughs> luckily, well, I won't even look at it. <clears throat> luckily, luckily, uh, luckily, the bliss of that, the voidness experience, and the voidness, which is, which the experience is not the full knowledge of voidness. The voidness experience is just a way station because the full knowledge of voidness is voidness within all the differentiation, not voidness apart from the differentiation. Voidness as all the differentiation, if you will, not even within it, not at the core of it or something, but voidness as the surface of it, the inconceivable, exquisite, incredible surface of it all. And and then, and then that's why voidness is compassion. You know, they say shunyata karana garbam, voidness, the womb of question. Actually, we're ending. So, so I leave you with the challenge anyway. And the thing about jealousy, I want, at the very end, you'll see where the last verse in this verse, I said, it says, so now I'm going to go around being jealous, contemptuous, and competitive with everybody. <laughs> where is that? Or I just want to take others different. lower, higher, equal as yourself. Yeah, I, Identify I, I, yourself as other than without another thought. Yeah, I left that uh, one. I think I left. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh wait, no, the fridges are. Oh, he quoted the uh, yeah, and it has the vow. It puts up a vow just before that, on page fifteen, I think. It says yes, taking inferior, equal, and superior beings as myself and taking myself to be another with my mind free of conceptual thoughts, so I should cultivate pride, competitiveness, and envy. And what that is, is an amazing thing, actually. And this is, you know, coming down from the big thing about Trinitarianism. This is like the way of beginning to practice the exchange of self and other, what it's called. Where okay. you exchange other self preoccupation for other preoccupation. And be preoccupied with others. And what that is, is that you, the way you do that in your daily life is you sort of become more mindful about your interactions with people. And when you meet people, you sort of admit to yourself. When you meet someone, you kind of size them up. This is in your ego mind normally. And you know, you want to know, are they a threat to me? And then, so you meet, you kind of immediately, well, are they better than me in some way? Are they kind of neck and neck with me in some way? Or are they lesser than me in some way? You kind of make a judgment like that and you act accordingly, even instinctively just like this, we do. So then they say that if you see someone that for some reason you feel you have to look up to, or whatever purpose, then you admit to yourself you have an element of jealousy about it. Yeah, you might admire them. But you know, on the other hand, like, why couldn't I be like that? The ego is immediately going to say, oh, well, I could be like that. Oh, you know, I could win that. I, could, I just didn't try that. I didn't train or whatever. I didn't have the advantages. And you're kind of begrudging them that bit, bit superiority. So jealousy is the way we react to the perception of superiority in another person. And if they're sort of very equal, competitiveness is how we react. We want to like be competitive with them. And if they're a little, for whatever reason, lesser than us, we're condescending. We might be kind and nice about it, but we're sort of like, okay, you know. And not, we're not necessarily really contemptuous, but at least condescending. So if we sort of admit that to ourselves, then when we meet another person, we look at ourselves through their eyes. We do a kind of mindfulness thing. We don't share it with them. We do a mindfulness practice where we say, oh, okay, I just met so-and-so. He has 10 million... Uh, uh, like Twitter followers, oh boy, you know. Well, I could have that if I spent my whole time on Twitter. So we, really, we find that somewhere, and we're mindful of that in our mind. And then 
we see ourselves as like a no Twitter or none of these guys not even on Twitter, like what's this problem? <laughs> and and we look condescendingly toward ourselves. And then we re then the way we act with that person, we become, at first when we try this practice, we'll become very self-conscious <laughs> and like a little constricted the way we behave because we wouldn't want to behave like sort of barely concealing the jealousy, right? And then if we meet someone we feel competitive with right away, we, get, we look at ourselves through their eyes, seeing them feeling us competitive and how they are behaving to us. And we, we look down on someone, we see them looking up jealously at us. So in that sense, we're practicing jealousy in the other mind, competitiveness in the other mind, and condescension in the other mind toward ourselves. And this makes us very different in our, it will change our social relations with other beings. We become much more sensitive and compassionate for them, much more aware of what their problem is and so forth like that. It's a very powerful thing. And you, you know, there is a famous book that was very popular in the 60s. It was a multi-million bestseller. It was written by a man named Ken Keyes, and it was called The Manual of Higher Consciousness. So you might be able to find it as a, as a uh, or probably pirated on the net by now or something like that. And in that he mentioned, and he, it's, it's, and he found, published it, self-published it from the foundation of living love somewhere in Tennessee, and I never met that guy. It was kind of, a, it was kind of around in the 60s, people liked it. And it mentioned Shantideva in the introduction, didn't say who he was, but never mentioned Buddhism, of course, in Tennessee, you know, in the 60s, you know. <laughs> and never mentioned a word about it. But he taught this teaching, he called it the automatic consciousness doubler. He developed a kind of techno, you know, Norman Vincent Peale sort of type of thing about it. He didn't mention Christianity either, but he just said, you practice the consciousness doubler, which is like a yoga of seeing yourself from the other perspective. I don't know if he mentioned jealousy, condescension, and competitiveness. I don't think he did. But he, he said how this will radically change your way of being with being with people. And he elaborates it just like Shantideva. You can tell he, you follow Shantideva. He's just teaching Shantideva, this guy, Ken Ki. It's cool. That's really, so you know, it doesn't require Buddhism, Shantideva. Thing. It's psychologically very profound, actually, this, this precept is. And again, the challenge. Whenever you feel happy, the challenge is, oh, I, I am happy because I wished the happiness of another. How can that be? I thought I was happy because I wanted to be happy. No, of course I want to be happy, but the actual happiness is, what is real happiness? Analyze it. When I do this challenge in a class, which I, I can't now because it's, I'd be keeping you too late, people do debate. They say, oh, I got happy because I wanted it this way and that way. They say, but... Then we try to, and kind of you see that. Well, the example is like I went to the symphony and I was transported by, you know, Mozart's whatever. And I wanted that, to enjoy that and I went there. And so therefore it was my wish for my own happiness that brought the happiness. And then you, then you analyze, well, but when you went in, you got your seat, were you happy? When your seat was not the best seat in the orchestra, were you happy? Were you irritated that other people were sitting? If you're didn't have, couldn't afford the orchestra and you're way up there where you're irritated that you're way up in the, up there but happy about the acoustics. Was people shuffling papers in the next seat without bothering you? Was this and that? Were you impatient for things to start? Then it started, well, okay, that's not that great. But at some point, somehow, you dropped out of all of that because the music got to you and you let it flow through you and you stopped worrying about the fact that it was Mozart, and then you were in this seat, and then they wanted the other, and then when you actually got the happiness, it's when you forgot about that you wanted the happiness. And the minute it stopped, it's when you start thinking, was this good as last time I heard Mozart in, the, in Vienna, or in like Salzburg, or like what? And then you're miserable again. And so it's the actual the analysis of the aesthetic, and Indian, Aesthetic theory, dramatic and literary theory, is very, very good about this kind of thing, very clear about it, and, um, and they do it. So anyway, this is the last session of this time. Do you have any concluding words, Carlos? Thanks. What? <laughs> no? Thanks? No, you don't? Silence. It's golden. So thank you all for coming, for giving us the pleasure of reading through these things and talking with you about them. And have a lovely summer, spring. Maybe we'll have a spring now after all this cold weather. Mm -hmm.
So. And uh, keep studying, keep studying, read, read things and studying. If anything, if there was any one takeaway from this particular class, six session class it is, Buddhism is not merely meditating, although meditating is important, but to make meditating fruitful, you have to learn something. You have to have other voices that will be part of your meditating, for which and you have to learn what they have to say. And so that's, that's the takeaway, I think. OK? So thank you. OK? Cool. Thank you very much.